But there's always this otherness of God. And I think this whole subject of justification is sort of, you know, made me think more and more about this, the, the otherness of God. And what that means is that um, he, the difference of what he is makes it impossible for us to really fully comprehend him. And so we use words to describe him that really are anthropomorphic words, words that we understand that he would communicate to us in words that we understand. But the, there's always the vastness and greatness of, of God that is, that is far greater than, than we can, can really comprehend. And when you think of things like, well, this God is leading us by his Holy Spirit, He's, he's guiding our lives. And the way he does that is by his spirit within us. And I think we'd prefer, I think I would prefer more of a cause-effect kind of relationship with God where you can s sort of see that, the, the, that he is the cause and the effect of that. But there, there's, an, there's a, a, a mystery of the spirit of God even dwelling within us, of Christ dwelling within us of God the Father dwelling. You know, the, the, the Holy Spirit indwells us, the Father and the Spirit, or the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Father and Son, abide in us. There's a spiritual presence in us we cannot feel. And yet that spiritual presence is to direct our lives. That's kind of mystical when you think about that. It's... it's it's the connection that we have with this God that we cannot fully comprehend. The otherness of God. I, I speak of it, the otherness, meaning not that we cannot know God. We can know God, we just can't know him exhaustively. I think we can know him thoroughly. We can't know him exhaustively. He is other than we are. And that's why it's so frustrating for scientists that they can't go back and identify God because that last step is beyond science to reach and that last step is beyond the philosophers to reason to and there's always this kind of you come to the end and if you're a Christian you get down at your knees when you come to the end and say I believe in almighty God I believe that he is this otherness that has created us in his image so that we're made for him and made to know him. And so we live this spiritual life, and, and the spiritual life should always be a sense of, of wonder to us, a little bit of a sense of mystery to us, and a whole lot of responsibility for us. But, but never forget that part that we have in, in this connection with God. I'm going to say more about that on Sunday. I think there, there's just some... Um, really a wonderful sense when you stand in the very presence of God and look at him and just say in a sense of awe and an amazement at all that, that he is and all that he reveals. Thank you. All that he reveals to us. It's, it's, it's astounding. So here we are. A new nature. We're born again. So we went from being body, soul, and spirit with the spirit part of us being dead to being born again means spiritually alive and with our life being changed because now we have eternal life and with the body being changed because we have the hope of glory and we are being sanctified. And this whole process is a process that God is accomplishing in us. It's not that he's trying to accomplish this in us. Sometimes we feel that way. He is accomplishing this in us. And so it's, it's important to understand this, this battle. The other thing that's interesting is the old nature remains a factor in the spiritual life. And I'm not discounting what it is that God does, but I, I think I could arrange the spiritual life in a little easier way. And it would be if this old nature that is defeated by Jesus Christ at the cross destined to be removed from us 
if it was gone now. We would be the most wonderful people to be around because we would be sinless. We could not sin and we would not be challenged with sin and the Christian life would not be a difficulty in our wrestling with sin. But this is the conflict. We have the conflict between the new and the old nature. And let's move ahead here and talk about this. But, you know, this is, I've always liked to draw this. And, you know, we sort of think that as we grow as a Christian, that's sort of what we're going to look like. We start out with this old nature having a major part. The new nature is we're brand new Christians, so we're just this little bitty circle. And the old nature is profound. And then as we start to live the Christian life, things go a little better and better and better. And the old nature and the effect of the old nature on us is less and less and less. And I'd like to to think that 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 is what the Christian life looks like over time. Unfortunately, that's not what it looks like over time. In fact, we probably look like more like this. It's it's every day. When we mess up, the old nature is, is really a, a pronounced influence in our lives. And when we're walking with the Lord, when we're having our devotions, when we're in church, that's probably that second one. You know, I think the easiest time to live the Christian life is Sunday morning in church. It's, it's the easiest time for me. Because here we are with a group of Christians, and we're all sort of together. We're all wanting to hear and listen to the Word of God, whether we're downstairs here or upstairs. We're we're hearing God's Word, we're hearing the truth, and we're sitting in our hearts, and our hearts are saying, Amen, that's right, that's exactly right. That's how I'm supposed to live, that's what I'm supposed to do, that's what I'm supposed to be, that's who I am. And we sit here, and this is a wonderful place. This is a wonderful place. Not because of the place, but it's a wonderful place because of what we're here for. And then we go out and live in the world, and the world is complicated, and life in the world is complicated. And our Christian life, you know, looks a lot like this. And you say, well, that's kind of messy. I say, it's probably kind of messy. And when I draw these things, you know, we, we, we can sort of identify with it. We look at those and say, well, I've, I've, been, I've been that today, and I, I've, I've been that today. You know, we look at this, and we can just sort of see... Um, by our experience, this, this is the way we feel. It's hard to drive a car and not be going from one or another of, of these. People cutting in front of you, people doing stuff, people yelling at you or whatever, shaking their fists or whatever they want to do. And, and here we are. It, it's, and people seem really comfortable in giving you a piece of their mind. And you look at that and you go, it's easier in church. It's easier with, in one sense, with our family. It's it's easier with the church family, with our own individual family. That all has, you know, there's no perfect place here on earth. I'm not suggesting that, but I'm just saying, you look at that, this this is sort of the battle that we face. And I'll give, you, I'll give you another way of looking at this spiritual journey. And again, I'm going to talk about what we already know so we can move through this pretty quickly. But salvation is, such, is justification, sanctification, and glorification. And this is all connected. And it's pulled apart over time. But you can't stop it. So what do you mean stop it? Well, you can't be declared righteous and be justified and not be sanctified and glorified. And you can't be sanctified and not glorified. Because you can pull this apart over time, but the truth of salvation is one truth. That when God saves us, he makes us righteous, he makes us holy, and he glorifies us. All in Christ. We have the righteousness of Christ. We have the holiness of Christ. We have the glory of Christ. That's all given to us. And, you know, you can talk about the promise of of righteousness. The promise of righteousness is that when we are declared to be righteous, we have the hope of eternal life. We have the hope of, of holiness. We have the hope of glory. 
And God is not just going to save and completely save some. He's going to completely save all that he saves. There's no break in salvation. You say, well, I know people who said they were Christians and then they walked away. And I never give up on people that walk away. I really never do. When they die, they're before God. They have to give an account to him, but I never give up on them and that they would come back. But I'm just simply saying, if they claim to be a Christian and they walk away and they stay away and they're gone forever, that's not God's salvation. I would, you know, say they probably were never saved in the first place. It's very possible to be saved by thinking you go to a church, so you're saved. Or you go to a Christian school, so you're saved. Or you grew up in a Christian home, so you're saved. And we can make all these, you know, assumptions. And we can act like a Christian. We can behave like a Christian. We can behave in a Christian community. I got a, a whole school full of students that are all really nice people at school. They really are. And this school is not like the public school. And I'm, I'm just telling you, it is, um, it's, it's really easy to be at school. It's easy to be with these students. We don't have fights at school. We don't have, you know, big problems at school. We don't have, we just don't have that stuff. Why not? Because the kids agree to being at a Christian school. Are they all Christians? No. But they, they come on their best behavior, so to speak, because they're here at this Christian school. I've been there for 10 years, and I've never seen a fight. Never seen a fight. I was at David Douglas for four years, and I saw lots of fights. And that was 100 years ago. But I'm just saying, there's many people who can come and say, well, yeah, I, I was a Christian. I, I went to a Christian school. I, I went to Mr. Custis's class. I, you know, I got an A in, the, in his class. I'm a Christian. I say, no, you, you can get an A in my class and not be a Christian. But salvation cannot be pulled apart. So we can always say, I am saved, I am being saved, and I will be saved. That's that thing at the bottom down there. Because this work of salvation is the work of God that he completes. All that the Father gives to me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. You know, the Father, Jesus said, I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd loses none of his sheep. So I take that and I look at the situations that I don't understand in this world, and I watch people, and it looks really strange to me. I can just tell you what the truth is, and that is that God never loses a lamb. He never loses a single one. If you are justified in Jesus Christ, you will be sanctified, and you will be glorified. And we look at that process, and it looks kind of messy to us. God looks at that process, and it is clearly accomplished in Jesus Christ. So we're aware of this, and I just want you to know you can pull salvation apart and talk about it theologically, but you cannot pull salvation apart and cut it up. That's, you can't do that. You let go of it, it snaps back together as this salvation that God accomplishes in us. Well, let me give you another picture of looking at this. And I, that does not take away from the spiritual the line across there, the spiritual pursuit. So at the same time, I can say, you will be holy. I say to you, we need to pursue holiness. What is holiness? Well, it's to be less like our old nature. It's to be less like the world and more like Jesus Christ. To think like Jesus Christ, to conduct ourselves like Jesus Christ, to be more like Jesus Christ. That's what God is doing. He says, you were made in the image and likeness of God. Now I'm going to make you even more and more and more like Jesus Christ. Your image is going to be refined to be like the image of Jesus Christ. So that's wonderful. That's amazing. Totally amazing. So... I'm going to give you this chart. This is, I've sort of given a little bit of this all along, but I, this is sort of a picture of the totality of your person. The line is the timeline of your life. If you're a Christian, this is going to be your timeline. I don't have any dates on it, so it's just sort of general. Above the sign is 100% holy. At where the line that says time 
you get over here and look at this. This is 100% holy. This is 10% holy. This is 20, 30, 40, 50%. This is 100% holy. This is the sinfulness. This is time. This would be the time of your birth. So I can draw this chart, and I'm going to pull the quadrants of this chart apart a little bit. But this is, this is your birth. That's not an accurate timeline, but that you can tell this person is not uh, moving toward holiness. He's moving away. And I can, I can show you a worse person than that. That's the natural man. We'll get to the nearest person. But this is the natural man, and you can look at that. I'll show you a worse one in just a moment. Here's this descent, and it's just... Perhaps when you think of sliding down, it doesn't mean this person is getting worse and worse and worse, but the, there is more and more sin that is, a, is a, adding to his account. It's more and more sin. It's a burden that these individuals, they know because they have a conscience and they know right and wrong. They know there's a God and they know there's a judgment to come and they pursue this pathway. Well, this is the natural man who is saved. And when he's saved, this is the new birth. And at the new birth, you're automatically at this cross line here. You have been forgiven of all your sins. And you have been clothed with the righteousness of Christ. So then your life looks like I'm saved by grace through faith in Christ. Woohoo! I mean, I, that's, you can tell this one guy's kind of down in the dumps. This guy, woohoo, he's really happy. And he starts living the Christian life. And this is the spiritual man. And at death, he goes to heaven. You can look at that and say, that's sort of a big picture of the Christian life. And I want to take now and look at the quadrant a little bit. Let me just look at this first quadrant. You're, you're standing before God as a sinner is revealed in Psalm 14, Psalm 53, and Romans 3, verses 9 through 18. And that is, you are absolutely, well, we've said, you're absolutely corrupt, in rebellion against God, hostile to God, alienated from God, and a slave of sin and death. And when God looks at you, he looks and sees this number one, that, that line across there. That's your standing before God. That's why when this person does something that's good, and we look at it and see it's good, this is what God sees, this standing. He sees this person at this level. But this is the experience of this person. He's descending. He's going down. He's walking this pathway. Now there's another person. And that person can look at the around and say, hmm, um, I am better than that person. So this blue guy, the way in which he sort of calms his fears and calms his inside is by looking at someone who's worse. It's comparative righteousness, but actually it's comparative unrighteousness. But it's looking at someone else and saying, you know, I'm not a perfect person but I'm not as bad as that guy over there. I'm not an Adolf Hitler. I'm not someone who's in prison. I'm a nice person. And I'm not suggesting that the blue guy is the one that gets saved. All I'm just saying is in order not to cross all the lines over there, I put it, that's the one that was saved. The other one is not saved. When the one dies and he's not saved, he is descends into hell. He goes to 
Hades. He goes to Sheol. And Sheol and hell and Hades are all one place now. And that's where he is. But it's a holding place. It's not the eternal place. I always tell you guys the story about uh, Dr. Ryrie. Dr. Ryrie used to, at ordination services, he would ask a trick question. He told us, he told us all of this so we would be prepared for the trick question, I guess. But he would always say, is hell eternal? And a lot of people say, oh, well, yes, hell, it's forever. It's forever. And it's not forever. This is the holding tank. The people in hell are going to be resurrected. They're going to be put in bodily form. They're going to be body, soul, and spiritually dead. But they're going to be raised up in that condition with a body that lasts forever. You say, well, did Christ die on the cross for all the world to secure the resurrection of their resurrection? I say, well, maybe. But it's certainly not a benefit for them. It's not a blessing for them. Because they're going to be raised up, and they're going to stand before God, and they're going to be condemned, and they're going to spend in the lake of fire. I don't like the way that the lake of fire is described. If I said we're going on a vacation and you'd like to come with us, we're going, and we're going to spend our lake, you know, in a lake of fire. You'd say, I don't think I want to come. I, I, there's nothing about that that sounds interesting to me. And when the Bible talks about hell, which is the prelude to the lake of fire, there's nothing about it that I even want to visit it. I don't ever want to see it. It's a place where worms are eating you, and it's dark, and you, you are burning, and you're in torment. And I look at all that, and I say, you know, that's just totally amazing to me. I'm a human being, so I look at that, and I say, Is that, you mean forever? And it's Forever. And there's nothing about it. It doesn't say, and you get time off, or there's a break in the day, or there's nothing. And furthermore, if after a billion years of this, Jesus Christ entered into hell and offered salvation, the people there would still say no. Because you can't be saved apart from the moving of the Holy Spirit upon it. It's just fascinating. That, and you think about that, and you think, this, this is... You know, that whole eternal death is mind-blowing to me. I mean, when I think about that, I don't doubt it, but it just blows my mind to think about people being there forever. The alternative is to be saved. And again, this is the new birth, and the natural man is saved by the new birth, which is the moving of the Holy Spirit. No one is ever saved apart from the Spirit of God. Old Testament or New. The dwelling with the, the people in the Old Testament New may have been a little different, but the birthing, the, 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 you have to be born of God. God has to save you. There's no hope in the natural man. There's no hope below the line. That's below the line of acceptance with God. And it doesn't matter if you're a little bit there may be the little old lady that lived her nice and she was, you know, bring you cupcakes on your birthday and, and she's sweet all down the street and a very nice person. Her, her little red line may be underneath that line, but it's underneath. I don't really know. But it's there. Will there be layers of suffering in hell? Well, they're judged according to your works, so I imagine so. But I'm not interested in going there to find out, to tell you the truth. Because whatever it is, it's, it's what, you, what these people want. Beware of getting what you want. And the gospel message can be given to these people. They say, I don't want that. I really want to have my own throne to sit upon. Not God's throne. I want to have my throne. Well, your throne goes to this place. That's the problem with that. So this is the, the depravity picture of all of this. Yes? Gary, then there's a difference 
between hell and the lake of fire? Is that, did I hear you correct? There's a difference between that. Because hell is cast into the lake of fire, the whole thing is cast in. So in eternity, we're going to speak of the new heavens and new earth and the lake of fire. So in several uh, scripture verses where it says uh, they'll be thrown into the outer darkness, uh, weeping and gnashing of teeth, would that be reference to hell? be reference to the, to the lake of fire and hell. Because hell is, hell is just the holding place and there's suffering in, in that holding place. You read the rich man and Lazarus, and the, and the rich man says, I'm, I'm burning here. It, can, can you send Lazarus that he could just touch my tongue with the drip of water? If he could just do that, it would just be relief for me. So I can, he's in Hades. He's in Sheol. The Old Testament Sheol, New Testament Hades. He's in the place of the dead where they're suffering. And that story indicates they're suffering now. That place will be taken and cast into the lake of fire. So, uh, you know, it's, it's hellish here. It's hellish here. There's nothing in either place where you say, this is a better hell than this. But that's the difference between when Riley would have the trick question. Hell is, the lake of fire is eternal. Or hell Hell is, at, is like the present, is the holding point. Right. And if my understanding of Hades and Sheol, we, we've talked about this, but if my understanding is correct, and I'm not 100% sure it is, but I, I, when you talk about Hades and Sheol, it looks like this at first when you talk about it. And there's, this is the heavenly part. This is Abraham's bosom. This is the hellish part. And when you read the Old Testament in Sheol, it's just this. When you come to the New Testament, it says there's a great gulf fixed between these two that no one can cross over. So you just learn a little bit more about she um, uh, the New Testament view of heaven and hell, of Hades more so than Sheol. But there's this gap like this. I personally think, based on Ephesians chapter 4, that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, and before he went to heaven, or he, if he descended into hell, he descended into this part, and took the Old Testament saints to heaven. Because when we talk about people dying, look at Ephesians chapter 4. Let me, let me read this. It's always better to read this than to just say it. <clears throat> but look at Ephesians chapter 4. It says, To each one of us grace, in verse 7, to each one grace is given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, When he ascended on high... He led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. Two things are stated about this. One is, when he led captivity captive, we can't... He gave gifts to us as we are living. Everyone has a spiritual gift. But it says here, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. Led captivity captive. What in the world is he talking about leading captivity captive? And I think he's talking about this heavenly part of Sheol and Hades. And he takes these saints to heaven. Because when we die, we don't talk about going to Hades or Sheol. But that's the word that's used with reference to the, you know... The rich, the rich man is here. Lazarus is here. Where's Lazarus now? I think Lazarus now is in heaven. And, um, but it says, it says, and now he ascended. What does it mean 
but that he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended also was the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. That's a very loose interpretation of that passage. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm absolutely sure that's exactly what this means. But it seems to me that this, when he ascended to heaven, he didn't ascend to heaven empty-handed, so to speak. The Old Testament saints and all that had died previous to that, he takes them to heaven with him. He's coming for us from heaven. He's going to take us to heaven with him. These saints will be a part of the new heavens and new earth. I mean, new heavens and new earth. It'll also be part of the millennial kingdom because they are going to be resurrected either in glorified form or unglorified form, but they're going to be there in that form. So uh, that's all I know. Uh, that's, and that's a little bit of interpretation, it's a little bit, it's a whole lot of interpretation of that passage, because it, it's, it's like, well, you know, people said that when Jesus died, he went to hell. I don't think Jesus Christ went to hell. I think he could have gone here. I think he got into Hades. I think he got into Sheol, but he went to this part. Jesus Christ went to hell on the cross. And when he said it's finished, it was finished. And we might think, well, because we're thinking in human terms and not in God's terms, when you have the eternal Father pouring out his eternal wrath upon his eternal Son, it is finished. It isn't necessary for Christ to go to here. Because I often, as a little kid, I used to thought, well, if, if, if he paid for my eternal salvation in hell, why doesn't he have to go to hell forever? And I said, he, and as I've grown in my understanding of the word of God. He did go to hell, but he went to hell on the cross. And that, we will never know the suffering of Jesus Christ. We can, we can depict the suffering in physical terms, and we can make movies about Jesus Christ dying on the cross and show the agony of crucifixion, and crucifixion is death by torture. Death by torture. Terrible, awful. And what Jesus Christ experienced physically was awful. What he experienced spiritually was eternally awful. Because he experienced the lake of fire forever for you and me. He said, well, how does that happen? I said, when we get to heaven, we can ask God. Because that's a part of this God. When we look at God and we say, there's... There's this otherness of God that's, that's able to accomplish these things. But the suffering of Jesus Christ, the greatest suffering of him was not what he, his death upon the cross, which was awful. There's a lot of people who have died on crosses. But there's not anybody who's done that for us, what Jesus Christ did for us in, in saving us from our sins and taking our eternal punishment upon himself and paying the price, the agonizing price. I, don't, yeah, I can't even visualize what all, I can say those things and they're absolutely true. To, to, to really think them through, I'm not sure that we're ever gonna really be able to think that through. But I know that I'm in heaven, I will be in heaven because Christ paid it all paid my eternal suffering, my eternal lake of fire, my eternal judgment that I so richly deserve, he paid it all, and he did it on the cross in a matter of six hours. How can that be? I say, because he's eternal, and because God is eternal, and because there's an eternal transaction that was accomplished at the cross, and I believe it. I mean, it's, just, it's one of those wonders that you can ponder and think about. Any other questions you want to ask about this that I cannot answer? <laughs> I try my best, but here we go. Well, I'm trying. <laughs> now, let me look at this other, upper part. This also is sort of interesting, and there's four aspects of biblical salvation. This is the person rising up 
living the Christian life, but uh, S. Lewis Johnson used to say in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 13, and 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, there's, there's a, a God preparing us for holiness. There's a preparatory statement in uh, 2 Thessalonians, let me read chapter 2 and verse 13. Um, we'll get there, hold on. But we are bound to give you thanks to God always for you, brethren, the love from the beginning, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. He chose you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. And that gives the impression that there's, there's this, in, in God, there's this preparatory calling and sanctification that occurs even before we are saved. That's not a part of our experience, but it's a part of what God is doing. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, again, reads... To the pilgrims of the Diaspora and Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. There's something before in that statement. And that's all Dr. Johnson was meaning about that. And to, to really define all of that, it doesn't mean that sinners are holy. It just means in the mind of God what he's doing there's this preparatory work, so to speak. So that's that first aspect. The second is very important for us to know. This is very clear. And that is our standing. You say, well, I like that blue line. You're standing before God. We say, this is my, we're going to talk about this, but this is our experience. Always touch it. This is our position. And you say, well, that straight line looks really nice. And that's 100% righteous. 100% righteous? Yeah, that's justification. God declares us to be righteous, and he forgives us of all of our sins. So not only we aren't just brought here to the zero point of not having any sin, but we're brought to the 100% point. So if this chart goes down here to 100% sinful, he pays for all of our sins. That brings us to zero. He clothes us in the righteousness of Christ so that we are 100% forgiven and we are 100% righteous before God. And every day you should begin your day and live your day knowing where you are on this line. And I said, it's one of the reasons why when somebody says, let's pray, let, let's, let's bow our heads in prayer and we're going to go into the presence of God and we're going to talk with God. In the Old Testament, that would sort of be like saying, let's all go into the Holy of Holies. And you'd say, hey, hey, we're not going into the Holy of Holies. If we go into the Holy of Holies, we're going in as sinners, we're down here. And you go into the Holy of Holies as sinners, you're going to die. Covering was given by the sacrifices, so the priest could go in, and so there's a sacrifice that has to accomplish this. Christ is that sacrifice. It's the finished work of Jesus Christ. But the reason why we're not afraid to pray is because we stand in God's presence 100% forgiven and 100% righteous. That's how God looks at you. That's how God looks at you. You say, well, I think God looks at me, and it's kind of pitiful. This is how I think I look at me in the Christian life. And, you know, this is a downward spiral a little bit, and then upward and down and a little upward, and hopefully we're moving in a direction of this direction. It's, it's hopefully it's climbing up. But you can have major downturns. This is a major downturn. That far into life? Yeah. That far into life? Yeah. 
Some people struggle in death, in dying. And the fear rises up in them. And God comforts their hearts and God's with them. But I'm just saying, this is the experience. And you, you and I will define the Christian life here. Always remember that it's here. So at the same time you're here, you're here. And we look forward to the day when we die, and there's a, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment, when we die, and this line and this line come together. Because that's what happens when we die. So why does, why does God make us do this? And I said, well, you'll have to ask him. But he wants us to see the victory over sin and death in our experience. He wants us to see the victory of Jesus Christ in our daily lives. He wants us to experience this. And some people may live to be this, this old, and some people can live to be this old. I don't know. This line can go for a long ways or a short way. But God's purpose is for us to walk by his power in holiness, to, to walk being led by the Spirit of God, be led in walking in a manner that is pleasing in his sight. Now, let me give you, you might have questions about this. Those are verses of Scripture that refer to your position where you stand before God. Number three talks about our, pro our progress. We live for the Lord. And Romans chapter 7 could be added to this passage. Uh, in, in the struggle of Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 7, even Romans chapter 8, the Spirit of God coming to our assistance, dominating assistance. And the fourth aspect of this is our perspective. That's where the lines come together. And when we die, we shall be made holy. And we await the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and we shall be glorified. But that's where this, this whole picture is, is sealed. But it's, it's helpful for me to look at this, and I'm going to give you another one other chart on this, but um, it's helpful to look at this to know our standing. That, that standing is so important to have. To be able to say, I am in God and God is in me. To say, I am fully forgiven and I am righteous, as righteous as Christ is righteous because it's his righteousness. When God looks at you today, he looks at you in your standing. And he corrects you in your experience. And he's leading you to where you shall be completely set apart to him. Now let me show you another one of these, this chart. Jerry Bridges used to talk about this, and it was sort of, this is where we actually are. And Jerry Bridges always used to say, we perceive ourselves to be a little better than we actually are. We're a little more optimistic about ourselves. We say, well, I think I'm, I think I'm doing pretty well. He says, well, actually, you're probably down a little bit. And he said, one of the things you should remember about the Christian life is your knowledge of the Bible and your knowledge of God is always higher than either one of those. You say, well, I want to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I said, well, then you need to grow in your understanding of the Bible and your knowledge of God because that's what leads you on that uphill course by the Spirit of God. Your knowledge of the Bible and knowledge of God. He also said something interesting that um, he says the distance between those two lines is the guilt you experience in the Christian life. Because you know you should be there and you understand that you're not there at either one of those perceived or actual lines. And that's why we feel guilty when we live the Christian life. And that's why it's easy for me to preach. 
because I can strum away on your guilt. Because you, I know that you are, you know, you know that you're not, and I know that I'm not what I ought to be. Because I know what I should be, and in my walk, I know the, where I should be, and it's probably here, and I'm thinking it's here. But that's where guilt comes from. We can live in guilt. Don't live in guilt. As you say, you know, you can only be where you are if you want to, instead of living in guilt as a Christian, live in the knowledge of the Word of God and the knowledge of God and pursue the Christian life. And it is a pursuit. And that's another thing that's fascinating is because God is taking us there. He makes sure that we will be set apart unto Him and yet it's a pursuit. It is a pursuit that we pursue. You say, well, how does that work? And I said, it works wonderfully for God. But we are responsible to live for him. We're responsible to obey him. We're responsible to follow him. We're responsible to do all that he commands us to do and to live for him. We're responsible to, to stand in the spirit of God and to be led by the spirit of God. All of that is what our responsibility is. But that's, if, that, if all of those pictures kind of helps you, I, I, I trust it will. But you ought to think about all the aspects of who we are. Because, you know, many people get discouraged because they just look at the Christian life in terms of their experience on this upward and downward walk that we have. And they forget who we are in Christ. That's where you get your assurance from, is when you know who you are in Jesus Christ, not who you are in your walk. That's really important. So, we need to take a break. We've gone a long time here, but take a break. And then if you have questions about this when you come back, we can talk about that as well. Hmm.
Okay, any questions about this chart or the chart before? Anything you want to say? Or, I just think it's, a, it's helpful. Yes. I was wondering, is this intended to show my, you can actually feel more guilty late in life as a Christian <laughs> when you're actually more sanctified right. than you do early? Right. I think that's probably true, too. You know, it's just that chart may sort of indicate that a little bit, too, that and you ought to say what you said about the children of Israel kind of being a mirror of... Yeah, that's what I was thinking of as I was seeing this, uh, just telling Pastor Gary, I, you asked that question of, you know, why does God do this? Why do we walk through this instead of him just instantly taking us to glory? And, you know, after the rebellion of the older generation, God could have just wiped them out and then brought in all the younger ones and provided for them and protected them in the land. But it says in Deuteronomy... You know, we put them through all this time in the wilderness, these 40 years. Part of it was to humble them, to make them know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord does man live. So the food, their clothing, their shoes, all this was for them to consider uh, that, you know, they, were, they needed God. And God wants to teach us that same lesson, to see the victory of Christ step by step. That's the challenge. I mean, it's, it's set before us, but that's what the Christian life really is. We're living day by day for the Lord Jesus Christ, and he doesn't want to live for him. He wants us to live with him. That's the other thing. And that's what Galatians is reminding us, that we are to stand firm in the liberty which God has given to us. We're to walk in the Spirit. We're to be led by the Spirit. We're going to talk about that being led by the Spirit of God. And that's part of that mystical part of God that has this Holy Spirit within us that is leading us in holiness. And there's a lot to be said about that. I'm not going to say it now, but there's a lot to be said about, uh, about that leading of the Spirit of God in ways that are in keeping with the otherness of God. That, that's... Really an amazing thing to think about. Well, let's keep moving in this spiritual walk. And there's some key elements to the Christian life. And I've, it's interesting, I started out with five, and then I got six, and I got seven, and then I got, I, you know, as, as I, I live the Christian life, more of these things. But the purpose of living the Christian life involves submission. There's a number of things that are involved. Submission to the Word of God and to the will of God. And that's part of the presentation that we make when we present ourselves, present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service of worship. It's presenting yourself to God for him to transform us. You say, well, that sounds kind of, it's submitting to God. It's like looking at the things that take place in our life, some of which are due to our faults and our sinfulness, some of them due to circumstances that are beyond our control. And in the midst of all of these things, God wants us to depend upon him. And I don't know why people go through the differing things that people go through. It's God's design specifically for them. You are living God's design for you. And God's design for you is not God's design for me, and mine is not for you and others. We all have this distinct pathway that we walk on. And when you see people suffering, you know, it's hard as a, <clears throat> as a Christian to see people suffering with physical infirmities like pain and, and the difficulties. And, and you look at your own life and you say, well, I'm not suffering with pain. And, you know, it's just you look and you say, why, why do some people struggle here and some people struggle with this and some people struggle with this and you struggle with this and I struggle with this and we're all, you know, it's like God wants us to see his sufficiency. He wants us to see his hand. He wants us to submit ourselves to him. And that's a daily submission to God. That's not a one-time submission that you make when you're first saved. It's a daily submission to God. Have your own way in me. And that's a part of the Christian life. That's part of what it, this walk is. 
And you're also submitting to the Spirit of God. Another key element of the Christian life, and we need to think of it in this, these terms, I'm talking about what you're thinking about in this, the experience of this walk that we're on in the Christian life. And the other is that, that, the, that God's presence is with us. God's presence is in us. And he wants us to live the Christian life in personal relationship with him. You know, there's that footprints in the sand. I don't really like that because I think God carries us all the time. <laughs> you know, you, the footprints in the sand, there's two sets of footprints, and then all of a sudden there's just two footprints. And you know, the idea is, you know, how did it go to two people walking in one? And, and the, the story is, well, that's when your life got difficult and God picks you up and carries you. That's really sentimental and nice to think about. But God really leads us and carries us the whole way. And we have a relationship with him. And, and you know, in my foolish ways when I think about this, there are times in my life when I feel like I'm doing things for God. And it's as if I look up to heaven and, I, and say, how am I doing? And it's as if the Lord looks at me and says, I want you to depend upon me. It's not what you do for me. I, you know, just think of this sovereign God. Does he need us to do something for him? And the answer is no. This is the God who speaks things into existence out of nothing. So why in the world would he use us? And the answer is so that we would see what he is doing in and through our lives. In and through us. It's a relationship with God. The Christian life is not a life that we live for God. It's a life that we live with him, depending upon him, trusting him, resting in him. And uh, again, there's some circumstances. We were talking about church history. There's some circumstances where the, you know, there were Christians living in the Alps and there were times when they would be attacked and they would defeat a force that was thousands with a hundred men. And you look at it and, you, and they were just kind of just strange. And then one time they defeated the enemy three times. Enemy coming up to just slaughter everybody. They defeated the, the French were coming up and the French that were led, pushed by the Pope to be there. They defeated them once, they defeated them twice, so they brought cannons up. How they got cannons up into the Alps was, you know. And they just blasted away at the fortifications of, of what these people were hiding behind until they knew that the next day the fortifications were all blasted away by the cannon, cannon fire. And they knew the next day was coming, and they were going to come up there and get about 500 men. That's all that were there. There were thousands coming up the, to get them, 500 men. And so they said, you know, let's pray. I mean, it's, you know, I, we're either going to be consumed, let's be consumed, but let's pray. So they're, a big fog comes descending down from the Alps. And it covers, it comes down as they look. The men know what, what the Alps are like up there. The French didn't, but... And this thing comes down and it covers them in this dense fog so that these 500 men are able to escape. And in the morning when the fog clears and the, the armies come rushing up to attack them, there's nobody there because they've all snuck away that they could only do under the provision of this huge fog. And... Uh, it's kind of funny because it says that some of the men were just, there was one man who knew a secret pathway that goes up and around through the mountains, but the men were shocked when they saw what they were crawling along because it was like really up on a up on cliff, on the edge of a cliff that just drops to nowhere. But they, all, they crawled all out of there, and they looked at it and they said, you know, clearly this is the hand of God. 
and the way that they were victorious in battle and, and the French were terribly embarrassed by the fact that they couldn't overcome this handful of people up there. But that's, that's you know, I read about these, these Christians you know, standing for the truth, and some of the stories that are told about them are awful. The slaughter of them was awful. But their stand for Christ and the provision that, that they saw in Christ was amazing. And the end of the story is that there's a handful of the Waldensians that continued on. And they were able to come back into the Alps and be there. And it's, it's kind of like there's, there's a Waldensian church in North Carolina but it's just, it's, it's an amazing, because we live with the Lord, and we see his provision. We've seen a number of provisions in people having really good medical reports. That had been really a wonderful thing. I mean, Randy and some other things that you know, they expected, not the report that they received. I look at that and see that's, that's the hand of God. And um, Jeff and some others as well, that just the, the, the hand of, of God is, is to be seen by us and so that we say, well, glory be to God. And in the face of affliction, there has to be the grace to be a witness of Jesus, for Jesus Christ as well. So I'm not just saying we, we worship in the good times, we worship him in the difficult times. I mean, we can look around us and see the mess that our world is in, the mess that our country is in. And do we despair? I said, no, we should not despair. Why? Because God is accomplishing his purposes. And we don't know what he's doing, and we don't know how he's doing. We know we're here. We know that he's providing for us and caring for us. We know that we should be praying for others, for those who are suffering persecution. But the Lord, the Lord is in control. He's accomplishing his purposes. And he's taking you on the walk that you're on because he loves you. So don't be discouraged. You're living the Christian life with the Lord. And then it's about our position before God, our standing as a believer in Jesus Christ. We have purpose to submit to God, his presence with us, and never forget your position. We are the sons of God. We are justified. We shall be sanctified. We will be glorified. God is going to complete his purposes in us. There's not one single Christian that God is not going to bring to the fullness of all of his promises for us. That position is important for us to continue to understand. Then we see his power, depending upon the power of God. We're pr prone to depend upon our own strength and power when we don't really realize that every strength and power that we have, we have from God. Every power in this universe is from God. And we, as the people of God, need his power. And we need his power to live a single day in the good times. We need his strength and power for us. We need a disciplined approach to the Christian life. We need to be on pursuit. That also is important. You know, we know God is accomplishing his purposes. He calls us to be faithful to him. He calls us to be obedient to him. He calls us to walk in his truth. He calls us to walk in the victory of Jesus Christ. That's a challenge. And yes, he's accomplishing his purposes, and he's accomplishing his purposes to his glory. And when it's all accomplished, it shall be all to his glory. But there's a pursuit. It doesn't take anything away from the, the accomplishment of God, but we're a part of this pursuit to be disciplined in the approach of living the Christian life. That also is a part of it. We also have to see the provision of God. The God who promises is the God who provides. The God who promises is the God who provides. If he doesn't provide, we're done. But he does provide. The God who loves us and cares for us and takes us through adversity sometimes 
to deepen our faith, not to wipe our faith out, but to deepen our faith. He's the God who provides. And if you just have a purpose and a pursuit, and you don't have God, His presence, and His provision, uh, we're really lost in all of that. We need His protection. As I look at the Christian life, I say we should be praying daily for God's protection to be upon us. Protection as we live the Christian life, protection from the evil about us. The evil of this world can be very evil. And we pray that God will restrain evil and accomplish his purposes. And then we also have praise. And we should be always praising God. And I read again of the martyrs, and one of the characteristics of the martyrs is their praise for God in the face of martyrdom. They're praising God. And whether they're up on the mountain having a praise worship service before they go forth into battle and die, it's just, I look at this and I just say, you know, our hearts should be filled with God and, and the glory of God as well. So those are just aspects of what it means to really walk in the victory of Jesus Christ. And I think more can be added to that. I just, as I've lived the Christian life and as I've walked through things, I, I think about these things. And they're sort of just taking little snippets and cross sections of the, what it means to walk in the victory of Jesus Christ. And uh, sometimes uh, the martyrs walked to the stake. And I think there's a martyr's grace for that. But they walked to the stake joyously, joyfully, joyfully, at peace. To be burned at the stake, which is not a good way to die. I don't know if there's a good way to die, but that's not one. But they had the, 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 the presence of God. That's why I said it's not just the victories you have. It's, it's the witnesses that you have as well. And there are millions of people who died for the cause of Christ. And we sort of stand on their shoulders, so to speak, because of their faithfulness to the truth. So be encouraged. Uh, living the Christian life is an important part of what we do, and we don't know the full effects of that. And you were talking about witnessing and whether we should witness to people or whether we should hold back from witnessing to people. And I say, as God gives the opportunity to witness about Jesus Christ. We are to walk into that and be faithful to him because we never know what the, what, how that's going to lead. And sometimes when I'm discouraged, when I'm teaching students at school, Martha tells me, she reminds me, she says, <clears throat> you're planting seeds. You're planting seeds. Plant seeds. Just keep planting seeds. Because it's hard to teach. This class is easy to teach. Teaching at school sometimes is difficult because you can teach wonderful truth and people don't care. The students don't care. So I called them people the other day. They said, why are you calling us people? I said, well, because you are people. That's why I'm calling you people. You know, but anyway, be faithful, be encouraged, and walk with the Lord. That's really the, the challenge that we all face. God help us, but that's the challenge we face. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll strengthen our hearts in Christ. We see our own weakness, we see our own inability, and we see the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see the faithfulness of your grace, we see the faithfulness of your mercy, we see the faithfulness of your justice, and we know that you are accomplishing your purposes in us and through us, and we pray that you would encourage our hearts in the victory that we have in Jesus Christ the ultimate victory, the eternal victory, yet the victory we even have right now in Christ. In difficult times, in good times, the victory of Jesus Christ. 
Thank you for the blessings that you give. Thank you for the leading of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for the victory of Christ on the cross. Thank you for planning the whole thing before we were ever born. Thank you for all you're accomplishing in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.